Mercury Preparations for Ultra Trace Mercury Analysis, presented by Jeff Forsberg. We will be taking questions at the very end of the webinar, so feel free to submit your questions using the question feature. And Jeff, go ahead. Good morning, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, today's webinar, Laboratory Preparations for Ultra Trace Mercury Analysis, um, I'm going to speak with you about some simple tips and tricks that you can uh, um, do within your laboratory, with any general laboratory, to uh, uh, gear yourself toward ultra trace mercury analysis. So, laboratory uh, spaces needing consideration. So, once you do a uh, uh, inventory of your lab, just take a quick look around. You know your lab the best. Uh, let's start with the sample and receiving. So that's a space that you can start with to start moving toward an ultra trace or a trace facility to help with uh, um, analysis and everything down the, down the road from there. Your reagent preparation area, that's crucial. Then your sample preparation area, and then your digestion area, and then finally your instrumentation area. The instrumentation area is important, but it's not quite as important as the previous areas, the sample prep and the digestion and the reagent preparation areas. So what can we do with the laboratory? So ultra clean facilities within any laboratory, you can construct these um, within that existing structure, but you have to have a plan. So what I suggest is you consult with other laboratories, maybe with an actual consulting group that works with clean rooms or clean spaces. Um, there's a number of companies out there that manufacture clean hoods and, and uh, portable clean rooms, they can also assist. Uh, if you're going to do it yourself, it's going to take a lot of hard work, or are you going to hire it? And then the most important thing is, what is your budget? How much funds do you have to spend on this project? Some of the general considerations, what's your quality objectives? Are you going for 1631, which is a US EPA method, uh, EPA 245.7, which isn't um, as difficult as 1631, or is there some other uh, UN or EN method that you're going to go after to try to do ultra trace analysis? So again, the laboratory assessment, that's crucial. And then your funds. A big part of this is your personnel. What experience do they have with ultra trace analysis? And you have to send them off for training. Is there going to be clean hands, dirty hands? Um, just what experience have they had? If they're generally experienced in a soil lab or a laboratory that works primarily with parts per million, they may, may need some extra training because the ultra trace analysis is a different animal. Your laboratory environments. You can go to a class 100 clean room, or you can up your game a little bit with a standard lab with good laboratory practices. Um, in most cases, a class 100 clean room for ultra trace mercury analysis is overkill. Maybe if you need a clean room, maybe a class 10,000, um, but primarily, um, especially for EPA 245.7, that can be accomplished with just good laboratory practices. That type of methodology has an uh, instrument or a method detection limit of 1.8 nanograms per liter, which is relatively easy to do with uh, most labs under a clean environment. When we get into ultratrace with 1631, where the US methodology requires a method detection limit of 0.2 nanograms per liter or less, that's a little bit more difficult. So there's two um, standards that are used to uh, classify clean rooms, and we're going to deal primarily with the positive pressure. There's negative pressure cl clean rooms as well, but those are for biocontainment, like the CDC, and uh, 
in groups like that will have negative pressure clean rooms. But in our industry, it's positive pressure. We want to keep the particulates out of the room and keep the air as clean as possible. So both standards um, classify the clean room or clean spaces by the number of particulates that are in the air. In the U.S., we have federal standard uh, 209E, and internationally, we have ISO 14644-1, which is the International Organization of Standards, and it's Technical Committee uh, uh, 209. On the right is a picture of um, a monitor that, that we have here in our laboratory, and it monitors the pressure within the clean space, the clean room that we have, and most of them will be in um, inches water column. So the U.S. standard 209E, that was actually canceled in 2001 by the U.S. Department of Commerce, um, but it's still widely used today. So a class 100, you can have 750 particles that are greater than 0.2 micron, or you can have up to 300 that are greater than 0.3, and only 100 that is greater than 0.5. So that's the classification of a class 100. So if we look look in the the greater than 0.5 micron, so a class one under this classification, you can only have one. So that's where the standards come from. So we have class 1, 10, 100, and 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000. So class 10,000, you can have um, 10, you cannot have greater than 10,000 um, part, particulates of 0.5 microns. Now the equivalency to the ISO, so an ISO is um, class 1, and the U.S. federal government is three, and the 100,000 is an ISO eight. So the ISO classifications, they take it quite a bit cleaner. So they have a two and a one that is cleaner than the U.S. equivalent of class one. So under the, the number one, you can only have 10 particulates greater than 0.1 micron and 2 greater than 0.2 micron and anything above that you cannot have any particulates at all. So that's an extremely clean space. Um, probably as clean or cleaner than most of the semiconductor industries. Over on the right there's a picture of um, the clean room uh, here in our facility and the monitor is on the other side, and the arrow is pointing toward a small hole. So this monitor measures the pressure differential between the two rooms. So when the doors open, that, that drops, and when it closes, when the pressure comes up. And this one usually is around um, 0 0.035 uh, inches water column for that um, meter. And that signifies that we have positive pressure, so the particulates are not flowing into that room, so it stays clean. So what we need is well-defined gradient of increasing cleanliness. So like I mentioned earlier, we start with sample receiving. That's the first zone we need to look at. And then the analysis preparation zone, reagent prep zone, and digestion zones, those are extremely important. And then finally, the instrument zone. And yes, we need to clean, keep the instrument zone as a clean space or a clean room as well, because some of the analysis can be quite long. And if we have uh, particulates in the air, they can settle in the sample, giving you a false positive or a bias. So we have a standard lab with good practices, or are we going to go to a clean room which has HEPA filtered air? Um, HEPA, there's uh, a number of uh, uh, names diff or definitions for HEPA, but one of them is high efficiency particulate attenuation. Within these spaces or these clean rooms, you can keep the area separate from other parts of the lab by using uh, plastic 
curtains, strip curtains, or sticky mats. So on the curtains, it's very important to treat it like a wall. So the, the analyst would not want to cross the barrier with their garments, their smocks, uh, their booties, their hats, whatever they're using to help keep that area clean. So they want to remove those at the barrier. And then the activities within these clean spaces, they should be tightly controlled. And you would want to treat them just like a separate room so it's a clean room. You can also use sticky mats to get particulates off your shoes. You can use the little um, booties on your feet to help protect the space as well. And in order to get people, individuals within the laboratory accustomed to these clean spaces, which are created by plastic curtains, uh, you can use crowd control barriers to, to guide them toward the sticky mats, uh, maybe some um, caution tape on the floor to help guide people around the laboratory. So the laboratory becomes a closed space and not an open environment like what it used to be. And it's very simple with the sticky mats, the crowd control, and the plastic curtains that where you can build these small rooms. And again, these areas should be strictly controlled and access uh, should be limited. So building these plastic um, curtains or clean spaces, across the internet you can find myriads of companies that offer these type of um, products. They have um, mounting devices. In one of the previous slides it showed a, uh, a mounting device. Simply mount it to the ceiling. You hang the, hang the plastic curtains and you've created a clean space or a clean area. And then the last step would be to have a high-powered exhaust fan and you can pull general lab air from the other parts of the laboratory and use this exhaust fan to force that lab air through a HEPA filter into the middle of this room that you just created with these plastic curtains. Now you have a clean space, a clean room that may suffice as a, uh, a place to uh, digest, prep samples, or run your instruments. Once you do all this, and even before you do all this, you, if you want to get into the ultra trace analysis, you could do a instrument assessment, find out how good you are within the laboratory without making any modifications. Chances are you might be really close if you, if you use a great GLP, um, and you may need to just do a few modifications to make this happen. But what's really important is to present a history of the laboratory. What type of analysis was performed in those spaces prior to attempting to make this clean facility or clean area? For example, if you did Keldahl nitrogens in a certain part of the laboratory, um, maybe that laboratory will never ever be able to be used for ultra-trace mercury analysis. Uh, you would have to do an assessment. and. During that assessment, there's things that you can do to help facilitate cleaning up the laboratory as well. Um, uh, flowers of, of sulfur can be uh, spread around, painted on the walls, and then cleaned up. That will take any mercury that, that is there and make it mercuric sulfide. So then you can gather up the contamination, try it again. I mean, there's clean room paint and things like that that you can also apply to the walls to help mitigate uh, contamination. So once this is all done and your assessment is complete, then your clean space should have as much inert material as possible within that space. We want to um, minimize contamination from rust and corrosion. So your countertops, your countertop should be some type of inert material, uh, maybe a laminate that's resistant to corrosion or rust, um, epoxy paint on the walls, inert acid cabinets. You really need to have an inert hood. Uh, a lot of the hoods in the laboratories today have been used for a fair number of years, 
and they're rusted and corroded, and movement of air is going to take that rust and those uh, corrosive part particles and move them around the lab and cause contamination. Even the little things like your, your drawer openers, they can be changed out to some type of um, inert material. Maybe it's a, a polymer coated or it's a plastic uh, um, fixture or something like that. Same thing with the door hinges. In the laboratory uh, instrument clean space, again, as much inert material as possible, the same thing, epoxy paint. Now, in your clean space for the, lab for the instrumentation, do you need an acid cabinet? My guess is probably not, because your uh, reagent prep and your digestions are going to be somewhere else in the laboratory in another clean space. Um, same thing with the inner hood. Most of the time you're going to prep your samples and then bring them into the clean instrument space and then analyze the samples there. So in this picture here, um, we have uh, polypropylene type um, counters. Uh, they're, actual, they're actually mobile, so they're on casters, so we can move them around. But that's uh, the clean space within the clean room. Next in this process is we need to evaluate the water source. Every lab rat needs a pure water source. So because that's where the reagent prep, that's the very first phase of good to great analysis. Water contamination, if you have it, it will cause total chaos within your analysis. False positives, it could be false negatives. You could have a lot of stuff going on with the instrumentation that can all be caused by the water. Um, so there's many sources for water purification systems. Most of them are similar in, in size and function. Uh, you just need to find one that, that fits your needs. So the volume rate that it can produce, um, repair costs, and that would include um, cartridges and filter changes and et cetera. Gas source, this is really important. Um, so on your gas source, we need to clean up the mercury. Uh, there's about 4,900 metric tons of mercury that goes into the atmosphere each and every year. And when we make um, um, high purity gases, argon, nitrogen, helium, all those gases, they distill that from the atmosphere. So the contaminated mercury, that goes right into the gas and it will be in, in the um, gas phase within those containers. So we need to clean it up. So to do that, we need a filter that can trap mercury, and that needs to happen with the instrument gas, the reagent purging gas, and then also the ultra-pure water purge. So a source um, for cleaning up the gas um, at Lehman, we have a um, gas purification mercury trap. It can handle up to 20 liters per minute gas flow. It's a proprietary zeolite that will trap mercury. And then also there is a gold-coated sand that you can use as an external inline filter. And one of the benefits of using this setup is the pre-filter and then the gas goes to the gold trap, and then the gold trap can be inserted in our instrument to check for breakthroughs. So periodically you can check to make sure that your mercury trap is uh, sufficient and working fine. And if you see breakthrough, then you would just get a new trap. But they should last a long time and um, um, handle a large volume of, of gas. Reagent and sample. It's very important, like I stated, um, they have to stay clean. Best practice is to have an inert, metal-free fume hood. Well, polypropylene works good. Another option is your laminar flow hoods. Now, you can have exhausted, or you can have the bench top. On the laminar flow hood, if you want to use that for reagent prep, I don't recommend it for samples that are, um, are uh, caustic or, um, or have noxious fumes. Um, so they should have, you should have non-caustic samples or 
reagents that you're going to add to samples within a laminar flow. Because the laminar flow, horizontal, if you look on the left, um, they can either have supply coming in the top or supply coming in the bottom. On, in this case, on the right, that's the laminar flow that sits on our bench. So the intake is on the top of the hood, and then it blows out horizontally. So it would blow right at the analyst. Um, so if you're working with, say, um, bromine monochloride or some high concentration of acid, um, hydrochloric acid, you would get a lot of noxious fumes um, right, right on you, and then you'd breathe those in. Where it will work is if you're working with uh, low concentrations of acid adding to samples, or maybe where you're splitting samples um, for duplicate digest or for spikes and, and that type of sample prep uh, where it won't interfere with your, with your breathing. The best laminar flow hood. Now this is where all the funds come in, how much money you have to invent or to invest in this process. Um, this is a vertical flow. Um, so all the air is pulled through the system and you have a curtain of air that's in front. So you open the sash and the air is moving from top to bottom um, and it moves right in front of the sash so that way the fumes don't, don't come out towards the chemist or particulates don't get sucked in to the fume hood and into your sample because it works like a positive pressure. So there's a curtain of air that's in front of the sash and it's a very, very nice hood. This hood can be used for reagent prep, sample prep. Um, it's the best all-around hood to use in a clean facility or even in a, any general laboratory. In the reagent and sample preparations, they must be maintained as a clean zone, um, period. And everybody has to be on board with that. Um, even little things like putting the pipettes away. Everything must be maintained clean, um, put away properly, wipe up after yourself each and every time. Who's ever working in that space, if it's a shared space, you have to do it. Because once contamination starts, it's very hard to source contamination. One thing that you can do to help source contamination, and this is for another presentation in another day, um, is serialize all your equipment. So your pipettes are, are serialized, so you keep a log of exactly what you used that day, and it can help you backtrack to find that contamination within that analysis. So again, they must be maintained as uh, a clean zone because this is going to help assist um, in avoiding contamination. And personal pride will go a long way in generating good data. If I walked into a laboratory like this and I was a client uh, requesting some analysis and knowing um, how to generate data and what, what laboratories should look like, I would be a little bit at awe and I would think, you know, can this laboratory really produce the data that I need? need for my analysis. And it could be that this client is reporting to a bigger client where they're doing a site assessment, um, and that site assessment is hinging on a large industrial project. Maybe it's an industrial facility that's going to be built. So you could have millions and millions of dollars hinging on the analysis. So you may or may not get that contract. So it's best to have a clean facility, to look like you can do the work and do the job, so you will get the job. So in this, in this little exercise, you have to do the best with what you have. And again, it goes back to funds. So on the left, there's a small hood there, um, and it's clean. It has things that are organized and neat, and there's a small small workspace. So it's a very small hood. Um, it is a, uh, a negative pressure hood, so it's pulling air through, so it pulls from the laboratory. But again, it's clean, so it's it's best best case practice. Over on the right, um, that's the laboratory that it's in a digestion area. It's not the best best looking 
um, hood, but it's clean. It has a few stains on the countertop, but everything's organized, uh, properly labeled. It's clean. The analyst is using gloves, um, proper smock and attire. Um, so again, it's the best practice. A, a, a general laboratory with a GLP can get you far down the road toward ultra trace or trace analysis for mercury. Along with the reagent prep, as I stated earlier, um, the gases are contaminated with mercury. A lot of these reagents are contaminated with mercury as well. So we need to build purging bottles to purge out the, the mercury from the contamination, uh, not so much for a continuous flow system, but for a system that um, um, concentrates, like a, a gold trap system or a 1631. Um, mercury analyzer where the mercury is concentrated on a gold trap and then it's desorbed off to the detector um, by either uh, <coughs> atomic absorption or atomic fluorescence. Everything that's in the reagents will be migrated toward the gold trap, collected on the gold trap, so you'll have false positives from the reagents. Okay, so you may say, well, if it's in the blank, it should be carried throughout the sample, so it might be negated by um, the intercept. This may or may not be true, but usually it's not true because contamination for mercury can act in very mysterious ways, especially in gold trap analysis where you're working in the ultra trace mode. So a very simple way to produce some purging bottles is to take an eighth inch drill bit and drill two holes in the bottle cap. Then you want to use eighth inch Teflon tubing. You can push one all the way down to the bottom and then have the other one more toward the top so it can capture the head space. So for example, if we have a bottle from the, the, the top of the, uh, the cap area is eight inches tall, so the first one going to the bottom, the Teflon tube, you might want it at seven and a half inches, plus some space to connect some tubing to it for the gas to go through. So maybe 10, 12 inches long. Uh, the one that's going to capture the headspace, maybe four or five inches long. And if we look to the right, that is a picture of uh, a bottle cap that's used in a uh, 1631 purge kit. Uh, that I put together that you can also make that has all the bits and pieces that you wouldn't be able to find in your laboratory to produce a homemade uh, purge fret or purging apparatus. Um, so in that case, uh, you would need a um, one-fourth inch drill to put the fittings in. And then on the, on the far right, if you follow my mouse, right in there is a... Um, a plug with a union. So in that union, I use a 0 0.062 inch or 1 inch drill bit, and I just drill two holes that are perpendicular to each other directly above the ferrule, and I create a point of gas access into the sample at four points. So it'll purge out with small bubbles, and the contamination will go up into the headspace and then the headspace can be evacuated from the bottle. So on the simple one, it's just a, to recap, it's just a Teflon tube, like you would see right here, going to the bottom, and then another one that would be shorter capturing the headspace. And that's a simple purging apparatus. And then you just hook uh, Tigon tubing to them, and, and you can start purging. Um, but it's very important, as I stated earlier, 4,900 metric tons of mercury are into the atmosphere every year, so we need to clean that up. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to be purging with argon or nitrogen that's full of mercury because you're just going to um, continually add mercury while you're trying to pur um, purge it out. In the case of ultra-pure water, you can add, say, 100 microliters of stannous chloride to uh, uh, a carboy that's, say, 10 liters to help reduce the mercury to m uh, metallic mercury vapor if it's not in that phase already. Most of it should be, but that will help off-gas off it. So again, ultra-pure water, 
you must use a trap also for your acid pur purging station and you must use a trap and then for your reagent purging now not all reagents can be purged so example would be uh, bromine monochloride or the bromate bromide solution that's used in EP, EPA 61 that can't be purged you can purge the stannous chloride which is highly contaminated uh, with mercury hydroxylamine can be purged and some other um, reagents can be purged to help facilitate uh, low mercury concentrations in your reagents so your reagent purging station I recommend taking out any particulates that might be in the gas stream first. So you can use a inline two micron um, gas filter. And then again, you need that HG trap. Maybe you want to use an inline gold trap. But one of the problems with using an inline gold trap is you need to have a way to clean it up. Uh, so in between each purge, if you had a muffle furnace that had uh, uh, flowing um, argon or nitrogen or something through it so you can evacuate the system. So if, because if you don't have that and you heat up your gold trap in a muffle furnace, eventually all the mercury is going to stay in there. Every time you heat it up, it's going to redeposit. It may not even leave the, the gold trap itself. Um, also, you may need a device where you can actually put it in an instrument and check it. Um, you're going to need a ball meter, a ball meter to adjust the flow. Typically, we run flows at about 300 milliliters per minute. Uh, for stannous chloride, a liter of stannous chloride, we may purge at uh, uh, approximately 300 milliliters per minute for 45 minutes to an hour. That usually cleans it up. Uh, hydroxylamine, similar. Um, for your low concentrations of uh, hydrochloric acid, like uh, 3% HCl, we may purge for a couple, three hours. So we'd make uh, 10 liters of acid and then purge it for two or three hours. I don't recommend going below a 3% HCl and trying to purge, because you'll actually purge um, uh, the hydrogen ion right out of the acid solution. So you, you will eventually neutralize that solution. Uh, a 1%, um, you know, we lose the acidity, so I recommend staying at like a 3% as a minimum. So this is very important. So these purge bottles, and uh, you you need to evacuate the headspace. Um, so the vent lines have to be exhausted. You can go to a fume hood. You can go to some type of activated carbon trap, maybe a potassium permanganate trap, but you have to maintain as a clean area in a clean space. So again, you need to take the headspace from the apparatus and you have to dispose of it. It has to leave the laboratory, whether it's in a trap or through um, the hood or some other source of, of venting. Um, purging apparatus, so you need to build um, or you can build purge bottles to meet your reagent needs. And again, you need to uh, exhaust that contaminated headspace. So on the right, I have a smaller bottle that I've created with that kit. So you notice the line is a little bit shorter. Uh, so that's the supply line going to the bottom of this bottle. I believe this is like a 250 milliliter bottle. And up on top here is going to be another hole where we connect a fitting for venting the gas. Um, here is a completed bottle with uh, the supply line going into the one fitting. And we use uh, simple uh, uh, Lurlock and Barb type fittings, uh, polypropylene fittings that you can purchase from uh, Fisher or some other laboratory supply company. You may have them even floating around the laboratory. But if you don't, you can simply buy that purge kit, which gives you enough for each bottle. In some cases, um, they sell these in large volumes, so it may be cost effective just to buy the kits. And so here's the vent line that would be going to some type of trap or something to uh, collect the mercury. So again, I stress this. We need to vent the contaminated space. And here's an example where it's vented right into the hood. Um, 
so I have the line going directly into the baffle in the hood, so it's out of sight, out of mind. I walked into a laboratory one time, and I, they were having some issues with contamination, and I asked them if they were purging their, their uh, reagents and, and their uh, acids in water, and, and they said yes. Um, so I wanted to have a look at their purging station. Well, they were purging on a counter with a Tigon line just dropped right into the reagent bottle. So what ha happens then is all the mercury in that contaminated source just bubbles up, and then it's going to contaminate all around in the space of the bench in that area. So that an area now became a contaminated zone, makes it very difficult to do ultra trace analysis in that in that zone. So it's so important to evacuate that headspace. One of our last areas for um, sample prep and, and we need to consider is our digestion areas. Um, they got to be designated as a clean zone. They ha you have to maintain order um, and keep everything in control. So you have liquid digestion, solid uh, digestions. If we get into solid digestions, uh, the whey areas, they need to be um, in control and clean. Um, one thing you may want to consider, a powder-safe laminar flow hood, so you can weigh out samples and then get them into the digestion tubes or into the microwave, however your digestion is to proceed, so they can, this can happen without being contaminated. Maybe a purge enclosure might work. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can make this happen, but it's all going to hinge on your assessment and the cost of the, the apparatus needed, and that all goes back to um, the method that you're trying to hit. Are you, are you trying for EPA 1631 or some of the clean um, uh, EN type methods? Digestion area, so your block digester, you clean metal free hood, that's the best way. Um, so in a polypropylene hood, um, because there will be some corrosion that, that may precipitate from this type of system. So if it's in a uh, metal hood, that may uh, enhance contamination, so in a polypropylene hood. But I would definitely put it on some type of heat-resistant uh, uh, panel or something in that hood that's also uh, uh, resistant to contamination or corrosion, so you don't damage your expensive polypropylene hood. Once it's all done, the whole laboratory, these clean zones, these clean areas, these simulated clean rooms that you may build with uh, the plastic strip curtains, you have to maintain the cleanliness because um, that's going to help um, avoid uh, second guessing from contamination sources. And as I stated earlier, if you have clients coming in where you're trying to uh, acquire new jobs um, for whatever, sometimes these projects can be big. They can be in the tens of thousands of hundred thousand dollars worth of project. Um, and if you don't look like you're going to be able to handle the job, you're not going to get that job. So it has to look good. Perception of good data is going to come from a clean facility. Whether that's true or not, um, that's up to the an analyst and lab management. So the workspaces. Um, again, you got to maintain order. You constantly cleaning, clean as you go, all day long. Period. I really recommend dedicated mercury labware. Um, so if you write a little HG on it, uh, some type of symbol that and and dedicates that it's only for mercury. So then other groups, you know, like the the GC group or the ICPM, ICPMS or ICPOES groups, they will not use that labware and cross-contaminate. Once you get it clean, it's very important to keep it clean, so then it needs to be dedicated. So everybody's got to play nice. So if it has a little symbol on it, it's dedicated for low-level mercury analysis, you can't touch it. I don't care. If you need a bottle, you need to go source it somewhere else. You can't take that one because sometimes when something gets contaminated, it can take you a day to two days to source that contamination. If you don't have a log, if your equipment is not serialized, it can be a real nightmare. And especially in gold trap analysis, when you do a calibration, if you have a seven or eight point 
calibration um, eight, five minutes per per sample. So it could take an hour plus to calibrate. So then you you're down an hour right there, and then you have to source your contamination. So at best, it may take a half a day. And when you have numbers you have to get out the door, you cannot afford to have these type of mistakes. So once it, once the laboratory is on board and the clean cleanliness of the laboratory is in place, everybody must follow the proper procedures. So if you're using strip curtains, um, sticky mats, you follow the rules, you guide the personnel into those areas across the sticky mats, Maybe you might be using, like I stated earlier, the crowd control barrier post. That's a great example, perfect to use, and real, relatively inexpensive. For the instrument, now once you go down this path, the final zone is our instrument space. Footprint, how big is the instrument? What's the bent space you're going to need? So create the clean zone, do an assessment if you need to enhance it, clean it some more, do an assessment. Power, what do you need for power? Make sure your power is there. Um, gas supply, do I need to filter the gas supply? Some type of uh, mercury trap. Is this going to be for um, non-gold analysis or is it going to be gold trap? If you're going to um, run gold trap analysis or amalgamation type um, work, then you must have the filter gas. If it's a continuous flow system where you're not using a gold trap, then the filter gas isn't quite so important because it's going to be across the board in the blank in all the samples. And it should be relatively consistent through the gas, through the container, the doer itself. But if there's any question, put the filter in. The filter eliminates any unknowns right there. So that would be a uh, determinant error because we know that there's mercury in the gas so we can clean it up hands down no issues and then venting the exhaust vapors from the instrumentation that's very important um, we like to vent through the uh, heating or ventilation system uh, similar to how you would connect an ICP or an ICPMS, uh, just vent it right out of the laboratory. Alternatively, you can use carbon filters, maybe a permanganate, a permanganate trap that'll take the uh, metallic mercury um, and oxidize it back to um, a mercury uh, um, oxide, and then the permanganate will re be reduced to, um, to manganese dioxide, and it will turn brown as it's consumed. Um, again, so you're going to need extra space. So this is a clean area, so it can't be cluttered. You're going to need extra space for reagents, uh, rinse, and waste bottles. And again, per perception of clean space is going to give you good data. Perception of clean space is going to give you the perception of good, concise, precise data. Maybe not accurate data, but precise data. When you're working with amalgamation or you're concentrating the mercury onto a gold trap and then desorbing, it's very important whether it's in a clean space or even in a clean room. So you must have some type of enclosure. I really recommend an enclosure over your samples or your, your auto sampler with a HEPA filter um, because even some of the cleanest spaces, we're probably dealing with a uh, class 10,000 here in this facility. So there's still particulates. Particulates can settle into the sample, and on each particulate, there is mercury. Again, 4,900 metric tons of mercury up in the atmosphere every year. Where is that? It's on dust particulates. Uh, some of it may be as elemental mercury. Now, elemental mercury is not trapped in the HEPA filters. They will go right through the HEPA filters, but they usually stay airborne, so they they don't deposit so much into your um, into your samples if your space is clean and you're using uh, HEPA filters to uh, keep air above the samples clean. So it'll stay in um, the gas phase and not deposit into the samples. So in this case, there's a 10 cubic feet per minute draw uh, 
uh, from the HEPA filter. Now, in some cases, if you can't hook up to a ventilation system, uh, you may be able to fashion a fan that would go over the HEPA filter to try to force air through, and then the exhaust trunk could go to a hood maybe and be evacuated into the baffle, which might help evacuate some of the space within the enclosure. I recommend the change of air in the enclosure at least every minute. Um, under this scenario, it's probably not going to happen. Now, this is a, a a bad example, but it's one example of what the laboratory can do to help facilitate um, clean samples and clean space above the samples. Again, I don't recommend this, but it is a possibility. So then you have the problem of trying to um, find a fan uh, that will have enough um, horsepower to blow air through the HEPA filter, and then you also try, have to try to mount it somehow. So it is a difficult challenge. It's best just to have the system connected right to the ventilation um, system for the laboratory so it pulls uh, negative pressure, so it's going to pull air right through the HEPA filter as is. So once it's all done, here we have some uh, depictions of some completed workspace. On the left is a clean space. It's not a clean room. Um, so in this facility here, it's easily capable of giving great uh, uh, detection limits down to uh, less than two nanograms per liter and calibrating down to uh, five nanograms per liter is a low stand standard easily. It's clean, it's orderly, and it's organized, so we know what's happening when that in that facility. Um, fresh paint on the walls, uh, clean room paint, um, so we eliminate that contamination there. Over on the right is a setup for um, 1631 type analysis um, with the sample enclosure, uh, pulling the heat fumes off of the samples and evacuating, and also the air is being supplied through the HEPA filter. So we have two different setups. You have your um, clean instrument space for um, trace analysis, and then you have your clean instrument space for ultra trace analysis. Um, so it depends on which route you want to go and what methods you're you're wanting to work with, and after your assessment. So in summary, uh, most labs can convert it, convert enough space to do this type of analysis. Analysis you can do it at at low cost. It just depends on your assessment, your previous history of the laboratory. And then, again, I can only stress this enough, that everybody must follow the rules. Um, so associated with ultra-clean spaces and, and trace analysis, the GLP, you need to step it up a notch. Everybody's got to follow those rules. So a clean laboratory can get you good, precise data, but not necessarily accurate data. But it is precise, um, and again, accuracy depends on a number of factors, um, going back to um, calibration sources, um, whether you want to challenge with SRMs and different things like that, um, even simple mistakes of making up stock standards. That'll still give you precise data, but not accurate data. So what we have. Um, for this type of analysis is we have a tiered approach to your analytical needs for trace analysis. Uh, the Hydra 2 AA, which is a CBAA system, um, that is uh, capable of uh, low PPB down to higher PPT analysis, uh, typically um, uh, method detection limits or instrument detection limits of 5 PPT or greater. Uh, the M7600, which is a trace system, it's a CVAA system, instrument detection limits down to less than 0.5 nanograms per liter. So that's a system that can facilitate good data at the trace level. And then the M8000, which is a cold vapor atomic fluorescent system. Um, and it also has two gold traps. You can either run one or two gold traps, so that's why I say it's the uh, cold vapor atomic absorption plus um, 
instrument detection limits, uh, typically uh, less than uh, 0.05 nanograms per liter with gold, uh, easily achievable uh, 0 0.02 nanograms to 0 0.04 in a class 100 type clean facility. In a clean room, class 10,000, 0 0.05 is achievable. And then the hydrate C, which is a combustion system, um, that's set up more for general laboratory analysis of solids um, and maybe some type of, of uh, sludges and things like that, but not recommended for high moisture content. So that's your group of analyzers that we could use in these, type, these types of analysis. So with that said, I'd like to thank everybody for attending the webinar this morning. And uh, if you have any questions that you want to come offline, um, there's my email address. It's jeff.forsberg at teledyne.com. And also I have a direct phone there, 402-738-5433.